the idea that there's a universal 40 hour work week period was started long ago without a lot of measurement or thought into it. That's just what we did. We're at a point now where it is just absolutely not needed. So that's something I get fired up over. Do more by doing less is that's, that's it going forward for everybody. The following podcast is brought to you by Thrive. Manage, run, and grow your business all from one dashboard using one login. Small business runs better on Thrive. Hey, hey, this is Gordon Henry at Winning on Main Street. And this is a rare moment in Winning on Main Street history. We're having a guest back for a second session. Yes, this week. Good job. We're with... We're with Charles Alexander. For those of you who are winning on Main Street historians, he appeared in the January 6, 2022 episode number 102, How to Start and Grow a Side Hustle into a Successful Small Business. And believe it or not, he's back to tell us about his new book, yes, Start sir. Now, Start Now, Quit Later, How to Start and Grow Your Business Without Quitting Your Full-Time Job. Just out on Amazon. You can find it in paperback or audiobook. And uh, welcome back, Charles. Gordon, I appreciate it. I like to be, uh, I like to make me uh, think I'm like one of the five timers on SNL. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's good to have you. And uh, as we were just saying, you're, you're in Gallatin, Tennessee, huh? That is correct. It's a little town just north of Nashville. And like everything else in and around Nashville, it is growing faster than we can handle. All right. So you're, I was, I was picturing you out like uh, in um, Jack Daniels country. You know, uh, there's enough whiskey around here. We we can we can get to some Jack Daniels without having to actually visit the distillery. Okay, all right. I've been wanting to do that uh, bourbon trail trip yeah. for a long time. Yeah, it's 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 a good one. I mean, they they got them here in the Kentucky, and there's a, a few of them you can do. Yeah. So, all right. Well, Charles, I'm excited to chat with you. Um, I know you've been a full time business coach since 2007. Yep. I think you've coached something like 2,000 entrepreneurs growing their businesses. Um, eager to talk to you about all that, but let's just start with this new book. Why did you write the book? That's a great question. I have several folks that have asked me that, and out of 250 people that have helped start businesses, 2,000 that I've coached along the way that are not just startups, but also existing business owners, one of the biggest hurdles, or one of the biggest things I see people do that I know they don't have to do is to go through the quote-unquote and I'll call it a midlife crisis. It's not always a midlife crisis, but that's just such an easy way to describe it is where they went to their last board meeting and it was their last board meeting. And they just have reached a point where they feel like they are not doing what they want to do. And now it's time to turn it loose, cash in the 401k and YOLO. And then they are off starting their own business, which sounds very sexy. And a lot of people are big into burning the boats and leaving no safety nets because that way you can't turn back. However, when I looked back over the several people that I had helped, the ones that had been more successful were the ones who started their business while they were still working full time. It doesn't mean that you are cheating the current employer, and it doesn't mean that you are half-hearted doing this, but you're you're taking a logical approach. And I thought, man, I, I'm instead of talking about it, I'm going to write a book about it. Yeah. So that was a kind of a theme that you brought up in, in our uh, episode uh, back in 2022, and you just hit, I think, on a really good question that a lot of people are going to ask. I got a full-time job. I'm supposed to be working for the company. The company's yeah. paying me to give it my all. That's right. And I'm starting a company basically as a side hustle. How is that not double dipping? How is that not being unfair to my employer? Well, it depends on how you approach it. We even break down a, a you know a tentative schedule in the book. It's not one size fits all, but to do this. And to keep your safety net, you're going to have to do some things you don't want to do to get the results you want. You're going to have to get up earlier. You're going to have to stay up a little later. You're going to have to work through some of those lunches. You're going to have to automate and delegate before you feel like you are ready to. Automation being we've got every bell and whistle known to mankind. I think Thrive knows a little bit about that in terms of getting things, uh, you know, getting the getting the robot to do the work for you or finding somebody that is uh, maybe not even, you know, uh, right here next to you to do some of the work for you. Uh, and then, you know. When it comes time to, am I going to work on the boss's dime? I'm never an advocate for 
working on somebody else's dime, but I'm also not an advocate for you making personal phone calls on the boss's dime, checking ESPN or taking a leisurely lunch. And I know we do all of those things. So I, I leave that up to the reader to kind of make sure they're giving their all. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the quiet quitting and you shutting it down. Uh, but you know, just use some common sense. There's too many people that have done it that didn't rob their bosses for that to be an excuse to keep us from doing it. Okay, so I know the book lays out a step-by-step -step guide of how you should start. I'm wondering if maybe you can walk us through it. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm somebody working in corporate America. Mm -hmm. I've got, you know, good solid job. I'm listening to Charles tell me I should start this thing as a side hustle. Walk me through how I go from I have an idea actually getting the business started and, and sort of that piece along the way where I've got to build the one thing and kind of sure. eventually decide. The first thing I tell folks is to come up with their most minimal viable prototype. Mm -hmm. Prototype's a, a fancy word. Let's say, you know, what would be a business you'd want to start, Gordon? Well, I, I'll think about our customers and um, the kind of business that our customers tend to uh, and our listeners tend to run our service businesses. So okay. rather than thinking about a prototype like a widget sure. product, what if I'm going to start, let's say, a roofing business? So in that particular case, hopefully you've got some roofing experience and that's something you're willing to do a little bit more on the evening and weekends. First foremost, you have a conversation with your family. Now, I've ran into entirely too many people that made that decision kind of unilaterally and didn't discuss <laughs> it with the wife, husband, kids, in-laws, outlaws, or whoever else. But once you make that decision, <laughs> Get some jobs going on your own. Uh, and then once you start that, you're doing, let's say you're a roofer, you have to have a crew. You're not doing a one-man roofing job. So you have to have the skill set to go ahead and bring in other people. Once you do that and you made a sale or two, you have the ability to manage them from afar. Use some technology. Use some you know, FaceTime to check in on the prog progress. Go out, check on them during lunch. And then it's up to you, morning, lunch, evening, to either make some calls, automate some emails to go out, have a third party VA make some calls on your behalf and then make sure that you've also got a crew that can continue to do the work uh, while you're managing it from your full-time job uh, wherever you are. Yep. But the, but the the important thing is to make sure when I say that minimal viable prototype, the offer, so many people want to build out every single solitary thing from beginning to end without ever testing it to see if that's what somebody else wants software. You know, you guys would know is a great, uh, concept of this where people will get a little scope creep. They'll get a little excited and they'll add feature advantage benefit over and over and over not ever just going to see what, uh, who is my target market and would they want it? And then going back to the original question, make sure that you, you can actually make a sale or two before you, do anything else right so if it's if it's a service business it's roofing or something make sure you are good enough at it and, and not 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 just in providing the the actual roofing but also i guess the customer service and the price you're going to charge yeah. and this, all yeah. that stuff uh to make sure that people buy from you and seem happy so that you're confident you could do it over and over and over that's right that's exactly right yeah so now, that being said, what do most people get wrong in starting their own business? <laughs> Shoot, I give a, you know, in, in a lot of cases, I, I even gave uh, several examples in the book. You know, I remember this one guy I uh, met with who never did launch a business. He would just kind of kept dreaming about a business. And uh, he had worked in a factory for 20 plus years and he had just dreamed about it over and over. And in his mind, that was planning. Planning and dreaming are not the same thing. <laughs> and he'd gotten really excited about this bar and restaurant that he was going to open. And we met and you ever see Shawshank Redemption? Oh yeah. One of my favorites. So you remember the point where Andy Dufresne, lead actor or character kind of loses all hope and he starts mumbling about this place of what Nehu and he's going <laughs> to see what the Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's going to go they... refinish boats and uh, yeah, red yeah. Morgan Freeman starts to really worry about him. Well, in this case, I'm Morgan Freeman. This guy is kind of off in left field and he's just rambling in here, uh, you know, incoherently about, the place he's going to open, the signature drinks he's going to have, and you can tell it's not going anywhere, and it never does. So, you know, one thing is to obsess, you know, be obsessive over something you never do. Just other issues I see where people make not great decisions are, you know, they're just buying a job, so to speak. Hmm. I tell a story about a lovely lady named Linda who, you know, was always in charge of the office, but as, you know, computer and technology grew, she didn't. 
but she was always great at herding cats and bringing in the brownies, but she wasn't necessarily good at what her job had evolved into being. And she had, you know, was frustrated and felt like people were discriminating against her. So she finally decided to just cash in her 401k and off she went and she started a florist business. Cause if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life unless, you know, you want to actually grow and start a business and manage other people that you're going to be doing some things that you don't love. Uh, and her business did hang on, but man, she was working harder doing that than she ever was quote unquote at the computer. Mm-hmm. And just other scenarios that are very similar to that, where people get gung ho, you know, one was a husband and wife team and they, you know, they cashed out all of their pennies and everything humanly possible, sold the house and they wanted to get into a recession proof bris- uh, business, uh, the Froyo business. <laughs> Uh, and why they thought that was recession proof, I don't know. I think they thought they were getting into whiskey like you gentlemen were talking about earlier. But uh, in their mind, that's that's what they were going to do to escape the nine to five. And then, you know, once they jumped into it, they realized, well, we don't have a lot of experience in this. It's harder than it looks and it's going to be much more work than we'd ever thought. Yeah, makes sense. So one of your favorite favorite phrases is do more by doing less. I see that yes. on your on your website, 100%. do more by doing less. Yeah. So what does that mean? And, and why does it matter to this discussion about people getting started? I'm glad you brought that up, Gordon. I have a, my own podcast, do more by doing less. I'm launching a mastermind in the spring about teaching existing entrepreneurs how to do more by doing less. We're at a point where we are more overwhelmed than ever. I was telling you, uh, you know, before we did this, I just had double knee replacement, 47 mm-hmm. years old. Wasn't it something I was very excited about doing, but my Old man needs decided we needed to. And man, have I realized how many activities that we have going on. And thank God I've got a father-in-law right down the road that's retired that can run all over the place and take care of, you know, kid activities and just help, you know, help my poor wife out with taking care of me or she's doing her home-based business or grocery shopping. And we're, we're at a point where we keep trying to add things, but we don't ever remove things. So every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to two more things. It's not even a matter of, well, I just feel like it's a little thing. It's not, it, there's only 24 hours in a day. You will be saying no to something else. So if you take on a, a client that might not be the best fit, if you decide to chase one more new opportunity or leverage a partner and resource with synergy, all the buzzwords with somebody else you really don't know, you will be turning down some other things. In a lot of cases, people are turning down family time. They're turning down, you know, a deeper relationship with a friend. They're turning down sleep, which turns out to be pretty daggum valuable. Um, so when I say do more by doing less, it falls right in line with what, you know, you guys do at Thrive and it find ways to do the biggest bang for your buck. The 80, 20 rule Pareto's uh, law, I believe, you know, do the 20% that bring you the 80, the 80 percent of the results. The other things you got to look at them. Either you're going to not do them, which is my favorite option, or you're going to batch that item to do it all at the same time, or you're going to automate it or outsource it. That's really your only option. So when it comes to somebody that wants to start a business while they are still working full time, they are taking on new things. That means other things have to be told no. Uh, And it's up to them. We talk about it a little bit in the book. What what are some of these other things you're going to quit doing? And it can't be the, can't be the easy, healthy things. It can't be, well, we'll quit going to the gym. Well, I quit coaching little league. It, You know, it's going to have to be some of the things that you don't believe you do that you've got to give up. Maybe it's fantasy football. Maybe it's uh, nonsensical internet research. Maybe it's five hours of, you know, a a day on your phone. But that, that, yeah, that's something I get fired up over. Do more by doing less is that's, that's it going forward for everybody. Yeah, no, that's, that's great stuff. And I I do want to mention, um, uh, I thank you for, for mentioning Thrive, but uh, I want to tell people who may not be as familiar, um, the Thrive product is really about automation in your small business. And um, there's lots of things you do every day. They're sending out uh, emails to you know hundreds or thousands of prospects or customers, whether it's sending out bills, whether it's making appointments, um, any of these sort of tasks that it takes to run the business day to day, many, many of them can be automated. And the Thrive software, uh, there's marketing software, there's b- run your business software, um, is really aimed at doing that. And while, yes, you have to pay for the software, um, it may save you hiring a person. It may save you, as Charles has said, hours and hours a day in doing these repetitive tasks when you could be much better spending your time much more effectively thinking about how to grow your business, speaking with clients, doing the things that a machine can't do for you. So 
Um, I encourage people to, to check us out, thrive.com. Uh, going along with your uh, do more by doing less, Charles, uh, another line of yours is create your uh, four-day work week in 90 days or less. Create your four-day work week yeah. in 90 days or less. And I've heard, you know, Tim Ferriss is famous for the four-day, uh, well, his is actually the four-hour work week. Oh my gosh, yeah, I can't keep up with him, dude. <laughs> so this idea of a four-day work week, is that realistic? Yes. Not just yes, but bad word, bleep it out. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> heck yeah. <laughs> heck yeah, it is, dude. I, and mm -hmm. I see a lot of people that are, you know, you even see this trending for employees at this point, four day mm -hmm. work weeks. And I know there's a lot of pushback and old school thinking on this. The, the idea that there's a universal 40 hour work week period was started long ago without a lot of measurement or thought into it. It's just what we did. We're at a point now where it is just absolutely not needed. So if you're talking about an entrepreneur and this, this does not mean you have to have 10, 20 employees. A lot of the people I work with are solopreneurs or they just got two or three folks that help them. It is totally feasible and viable for you to create a four day work week. Now a four day work week does not mean, does not have to mean Monday through Thursday, three day week. And you choose however your four day work week looks like, whether it's one full off day or you work five days in a row, shorter period of time. Maybe you work like a fireman, three long days and take the rest off. The point is that it's feasible if you'll do a few things first. What I try to tell folks is, you know, grab that low hanging fruit before you can do anything else. Free up a couple of hours uh, of your time. And there's several different ways to do that. I've taught a lot of people to do it. Silly as it sounds, working with just Gen Xers and baby boomers, take a little, shave a little time off that phone. And if you don't believe, if you don't believe your time, your time on your phone is harming you, especially you're an iPhone user, go to the settings, go to the screen time, go look at your activities. Mm. I can find you a couple hours right there without ever doing anything else. But then for the rest of us, you know, batch the amount of time you spend checking email. We spend 28% of our day checking email like little robots. It's insane. That's everybody else's to-do list. Batch that out. Do it twice a day, once at lunch, once at the end of the day, and you'll find most of those things aren't really that necessary. Or better yet, go on with the Tim Ferriss thing. Go on an information detox. Turn the flipping TV off and the radio down. It is killing us while we are constantly worried about what's going on golly, uh, a million miles away or right at our back door, everything is hell bent to make us laser focused on the worry in the world. If you can free up just a couple of hours, then the rest of it starts to become a whole lot easier. And I, and I work with people on this. Like I said, we're launching a mastermind 2024 20, to teach people how to track what they're doing regularly, almost like you would with a budget for personal finance or a food diary to lose weight. And then uh, that's it. Once you get those two things down, then, man, we start automating. We start batching. We start saying no to some stuff. We start outsourcing, and that four-day work week shows up pretty quickly. Hmm. Fascinating listening to you because I guess I'm old-fashioned. You know, I started as a young whippersnapper out of college, and I thought I'd get ahead by getting in earlier, mm -hmm. working later. You know, yeah. I figure the, at least you can control <clears throat> you know, your sort of attitude. And I was like, I'm going to be the first car in the park. Right. First come in last week, outmoded, uh, history shouldn't do that anymore. Bad idea. It just depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to go into a fortune 500 and impress the boss and get a corner office one day, yeah, be the first one there, be the last <laughs> one to leave. Uh, you know, and if that's, if that's the trade off you want to make, go for it. But if you want to be an, a thriving entrepreneur that has a family, has a life, doesn't resent the business you have, uh, doesn't thrive on, like I said, checking email, text, nonsensical meetings, having people pick your brain, doing things that don't light you up or make you happy. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that big into that. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you saying this, I mean, Gordon, I bet you, you know, you and me are probably not that far off in age. I'm, I started out in a, you know, fortune 500. I worked for the largest franchise or in the country. I've worked at you know, a place of higher education and I've seen people do it and I've seen them quote unquote, get ahead. And I saw them when they got to the end. That's <laughs> new. To, that's not who I wanted to be when I grow up, man. I grew up in a family owned business where my dad had to learn the hard way. He came out of a large, uh, you know, regional hospital and he got his own businesses going and no, that one business turned into six or seven different businesses down the road. And he finally got to a point when he reached the end of his quote unquote career, found a way he turned it off. He, he went from a furniture store 
through a control climate storage unit. The point was, wasn't that he didn't feel like he was being lazy, but man, that control climate storage unit, best thing he ever did because it managed to, you know, he didn't have to manage people. He didn't have to manage expectations. He automated everything there. He just, I mean, he's a 74-year-old man who can log in from his computer, check on anything he wants, and life is good. So it, yeah, you, you absolutely can, can. It can be done, man, and you can do it the other way. I, I just want you to, I want you to see the end in mind when you do it the other way and see, is that what you really want to spend the next 40 years doing? Very interesting. Well, <clears throat> let's turn to your business uh, besides the book, which is sure. explainer videos. Remind yeah. us what that we talked about it on the last show, but that's sure. a year and a half ago. Uh, oh yeah. What, uh, tell us about the explainer video business. That's, a, that's honestly a business where I kind of, I'm using as an example in the book, about how do you can start a full-time bit, you know, how you can create a full-time business while you, without quitting your full-time job. That's one I never even intended on starting. I was just trying to make a little side hustle money, updating people's websites, writing content and, you know, creating email newsletters. And then when I started doing that, I realized, well, people really seem to like video. So one of the very first clients I had, I offered him opportunity to create video based on the email newsletter. Problem was Gordon, I didn't know how to create video, but that's what he picked. So I quickly learned and that bad video I made outperformed the uh, written content that I did uh, several times over. So I learned how to do that. So I, that was eight, nine years ago. So fast forward to where we are now. I create explainer videos for busy professionals. Most of those are financial advisors, insurance agents, business coaches, people like you were talking about that are service providers where mm -hmm. they're uh, an authority in the business. But at this point, uh, I, you know, have my automated methods of doing outreach. I do some automated webinars so people can learn stuff from me. I create a ton of free content where they can learn how to do it themselves if they want to. But the point being is that I'm, you know, positioning myself as the authority without having to stay on top of it and do every aspect of it. So if uh, somebody now, they want a video, it's real simple. They can, you know, go on our site, they can immediately buy it, or they can schedule a few minutes to chat about it, but I've made it super simple. The only work they do is fill out a simple six question form. And from there, between uh, my team, a little AI and, you know, some, some well thought out processes, they get a video in 17 days or less that talks about them, their business, but most importantly, helps them reach out to their customer and explain why they're different. Hmm. That's amazing. Sounds like that's going pretty well. It is going well. I'm, I'm you know, dude, I've it, using all of the techniques that I've talked about. I've been able to keep that thing rocking and rolling and I'm not hovering over the top of it. I, you know, it, it's doing what it is supposed to do. I check in regularly. I make sure my team is happy. I make sure we know what's coming down the pipeline. We make any adjustments necessary. And that frees me up to do more of the actual coaching that I'll makes me happy that lights me up that teaches people how to do more by doing less right good stuff uh hey charles we're going to take a quick break uh just to work from our sponsor we'll be back in just 30 seconds with more from charles alexander don't be, go anywhere this episode of winning on main street is brought to you by thrive the small business management platform that you and your customers will love no matter where you are thrive helps you run your business keep organized and get paid faster all from one login and dashboard Thrive makes it easy for customers to find you online, instantly interact, and stay engaged. And with free unlimited support 24-7, there really is no comparison. Go to thrive.com slash pod for a quick demo to see everything Thrive can do. And we're back with Charles Alexander, uh, expert business coach for entrepreneurs and people wanting to start their own business. He has a new book out called Start Now, Quit Later, How to Start and Grow Your Business without quitting your full-time job. So Charles, I'm curious, you know, your, your idea is start your business and prove the concept before you leave your full-time job, um, which I uh, think is, is a really interesting idea. I want to know what should you never do when testing your business idea? You know, <laughs> you've got, got this idea. What should, what shouldn't I do when <clears throat> testing it out? I can tell you what you shouldn't do. And I've seen time and again, and I've been guilty of doing this. Anytime I even want to launch a new product with long, you know, business coaching or explainer videos, I get really tempted to go ask people who I know will give me favorable feedback. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people that are starting their new business venture, whether it's that roofer or digital marketer or, you know, the caterer, they go ask friends and family. 
But what do you think? Oh, Gordon, mm, I, you know what? You just make the best barbecue, bud. I just, I, I believe you. You should just go on down there and sign that lease of the place that just went under. That's got your name all over, buddy. We'll be your first customers in line. You know, I do this with a. Uh, I work with insurance agents quite a bit to make videos. Well, anytime somebody starts an agency, everybody they talk to is suddenly going to switch over everything from State Farm, Farm Bureau, and Allstate, and they're going to be their best customer until they don't. So I tell people. You've got to hone in. You got that minimal viable product. Or who is most likely to be your customer? Which is really one of the first things we got to work through because unfortunately everybody thinks that anybody will be their customer. And that's just never the case. It has to get narrowed down over and over and over. In your first year or two, that'll change a little bit. But go talk to some people that you might not really know. So I tell them, you know, create a list of 10 to 20 people that you know, like, and trust. Don't ask them what they think about your business, but go ask. Gordon, go ask Tim, say, hey, who do you know that, uh, you know, may may need this type of product or service? Can you introduce us? I will not sell to them. I am just out on a fact-finding mission. Tell them it'll take five, ten minutes of their time. And when you get that person on the phone, and I do recommend that you don't necessarily just do this through email or uh, surveys, although that's fine. It's, there's something to face-to-face, ear-to-ear, where they'll tell you, and they'll tell you what they're not telling you sometimes. And then from that, you can say, you know, hey, uh, what what would you think of this product or service? What would you like to see? What would you not care about? What would make it more important to you? What would be the delivery time? What would you be willing to pay? And again, while you're telling them this, you're reassuring them you're not trying to sell to them. Uh, Great book on this, by the way, Nail It Then Scale It. I forget the author's name. Man, that's a really good book on how to do this whole process. Uh, and we cover that somewhat in mind, but find, get some answers. Get some answers you're uncomfortable with. Now, the problem is I have a lot of people that get answers they don't like <laughs> and then kind of sweep them under the rug and, and mm-hmm. not pay not pay many attention. So that's get some answers you need to hear before developing anything. Once you got the answers, make your minimal viable product around that and then start testing the market with some people that are willing to buy the So one of the other mistakes that I see quite a bit of is that people go all in, man. They'll get, they'll get the site fully developed, pay big money for it. They'll trademark stuff. My gosh, don't trademark anything yet. If you don't have a real product or service, they'll do the quote unquote right thing. They'll form the LLC. They'll get the business checking account. They'll get the business insurance. They'll print the business cards. And it's backwards from what I know I'm supposed to tell you, but don't do any of that first. Every virtually every county rules and regulations on planet earth allow you a leeway so where i live we you get up to three thousand dollars i can make three grand before i have to start you know calling it anything other than a hobby business in some places bigger than that in some places it just doesn't matter man the guy with a black you know briefcase and long trench coat is not waiting out to knock on your door if you made 10 grand accidentally go make the 10 grand That's going to give you a little confidence and more importantly, a little know-how to understand if this is viable. Go sell some stuff first. And then once you get that little bit of proof of concept, then you can backfill. Yeah, great advice and very interesting. So Charles, uh, just a couple minutes left. Um, You've now, uh, you got the explainer video business going. You've written the book. What's next for you? What's, uh, where, where are things going for Charles? Man, I'm doubling down on this new do more by doing less. I am going to help existing entrepreneurs cut some of their time out so they can work on things they love working on. I'm going to uh, double back, get to uh, get to start now, quit later, and uh, do a mastermind with it as well. I've uh, done a ton of work, you know, with courses and stuff, but I really fully believe going forward a lot of a lot of effort to get people through change is going to be through group coaching through. And the group term mastermind, my gosh, is overblown. I just don't have a better word for it yet. We're working with people in small groups where they can see change in other people and know that they can make it in themselves. That's what I'm doing. Good stuff. Well, Charles, it's been great having you on for a second time. Uh, rare moment. And uh, thank you so much. The book uh, uh, is uh, hopefully going to be a big hit. And I know your explainer man. videos. Uh, and so again, if anybody wants to uh, check it out, which I recommend, uh, go to Amazon, start now, quit later, how to start and grow your business without quitting your full-time job, Charles Alexander. Again, Charles, thanks for joining us today. Gordon, I appreciate it. Love being in the top percent here for you, bud. 
Awesome. And I want to thank our producer, Tim Alima, and coordinators, Diet Barnett and Daniel Huddleston. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your colleagues, friends, and family to subscribe. And please leave us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate it. It helps us with the ranking. Small business runs better on Thrive. Get a free demo at thrive.com slash pod. And check out our new free product, Command Center at thrive.com. Until next time, make it a great week. Bye.